Hello, my family communication scholars. Welcome to our first lecture of the semester. This will actually be covering chapter one, which is all about providing um, really important definitions and foundations so that as we move forward in the other chapters, we have a strong understanding of very key concepts that we need in order to understand the more complex concepts that are going to come forward. And so in this chapter, you'll see that the book spends a lot of time teasing out the word family, the word culture and other various words that we might hear on a regular basis or use in our everyday conversations. But one of the things I want you to recognize is that um, you have to understand these words in the context of communication studies, specifically in the context of family communication. So, for example, we're about to go over the definition of family first here in this chapter. Um, we've all used the word family in our everyday conversation. Really what I want you to do and the book wants you to do in this chapter is start to orient your mind in understanding the word family from a social scientific research communication perspective so that we can better understand how families communicate and ultimately um, understand the various strategies for family communication that we're going to learn down the road. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the very first thing that we learn is that family um, is a very complex definition. So I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. And then in the next uh, slide, I'm going to go ahead and tease it out. A family is a self-defined group of intimates who create and maintain themselves through their own interactions and their interactions with others. A family may include both voluntary and involuntary relationships. It creates both literal and symbolic, internal and external boundaries, and it evolves through time. It has a history, a present, and a future. And that's a complete mouthful, and I know that's a hard, uh, a lot of things to get through. So let's go ahead and tease it out. So you can see here that I've taken the same definition and I've just broken it down into smaller pieces so that we can understand the impact of each of the words in that definition. So um, the first thing that I want to recognize is that when family members um, identify other individuals as family, their self-definition is their reality. What that tells us is that family does not mean you're only limited to those who with whom you are biologically blood related to, your family could be anyone that you define as a family member, right, that you see as part of your family, that is part of that intimate circle, and you choose to be part of a family with that person, and they choose to be in the same family with you. And so that's a really important thing to understand first and foremost. And for the purposes of this class as well, when I write family in your journals and I say, please reflect on your family members, or please reflect on family concepts, I'm not just talking talking about people with whom you are blood related to. It could mean anyone um, that you grew up with um, that you consider to be your family, okay? Um, the second one uh, is a, a key part of why we're having this class, which is conversation, right? Um, families uh, always interact with one another, um, and their interactions with one another um, influence future interactions that they have. So, for example, if you're a young child growing up and your grandma or grandpa are very, very supportive of you, they go to some of your sports games or they go to school events for you, and they support you in a multitude of different ways by talking to you and supporting you, um, you can expect as you grow up that they will continue to do that. So maybe as a teenager, they will continue to be people that you look to for guidance and support. And that's an example of how in families, the interaction is different from everyday interactions that we have with coworkers or friends because family members can expect to influence one another continuously throughout many years of their lives, right? Um, things that your grandma or grandpa taught you as a child, you are most likely going to remember at least a little of it, if not a lot of it, um, as a teenager. Um, and I'm using, of course, grandma and grandpa as just an example. I'm, again, referring to anyone in your family that you believe could have influenced you a lot into becoming who you are today. Um, Ultimately, uh, conversation and communication also teaches people in the family um, how they can relate to one another. So, for example, for a majority of us, we grow up calling our parents mom and dad. Um, very few of us, um, I believe, call our parents by their first names. Um, depending on what type of culture you grew in, you had an official title for your mom and your dad as well. Um, and so you learned the way that you have to refer to your mom and dad is not only in title, but also the respect that you have to give them. Um, 
Um, one example could be maybe as a young child, you would interrupt your parents a lot and they might say, hey, wait, um, adults are talking right now. You have to wait your turn to talk. Um, in that example, your parents or whatever the adult figure is, is teaching you as a child the rules of how to interact in that family, when you can say something, when you can't say something, who to uh, who to go to for certain things, um, how to call a certain person by their title, right, uncle or auntie or mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, abuela, um, abuelo, all of those kinds of titles come with you learning through communication and being taught that by your family. Um, and ultimately embedded within those ideals is family values, right? Um, so for example, you might find, and we'll cover this uh, far later in other chapters as well more in depth but you might find that if you are a child of um, immigrants who came here to the United States that you may or may not have heard the story of how your parents came here to the United States um, your parents communicating that story to you also communicates family values right communicates why you're here um, they may have um, asked you to work really hard in school or do your best because there are immigrant families that have been here um, to try to give you the best life possible. And that's just one example out of many um, of how family stories, family communication can set out um, not only rules of how families interact, but also the family values that drive that family. Um, the next uh, uh, category of our definition, voluntary or un uh, involuntary, again, um, just going back to self-definition ties really well together. An involuntary family um, Really, we're all born into an involuntary family. Um, so we uh, usually are born into a family not of our choosing as babies, right? Um, so we're either bound by law to someone um, or we're bound biologically by birth to someone. And then that may or may not change as we grow. We might um, expand into a voluntary family or we might um, cut off different relationships with those in our involuntary family and only keep other certain relationships. So for example, someone may be born into um, a family where they have a mother and a father. Um, however, they may cut off ties with their father as they grow up because of a conflict and maintain a voluntary connection to their mother as an adult. So that's just one example. And that's in a degree of choice. Um, Families also create what we call boundaries, and boundaries can be both physical and um, psychological. And so let me do the physical, literal boundaries first, and then I'll do the psychological. So literal um, boundaries are any time a family sets up physical boundaries that keep people out. The best example of this is your home, right? Whatever home you grow up in is your family space. It's where your family probably interacts the most on a daily basis face-to-face, -face, um, and you do a lot of your activities in your home, whatever your home looks like. It can also mean um, land, right, where you put your land. It can also mean physically where you decide to, for example, bury your loved ones after they've passed away. And those are physical boundaries that kind of set that this piece of land or this area belongs to us as a family. Um, but the more important and more pervasive ones that we're interested in as communication studies um, scholars is the psychological boundaries, which are the mental mental boundaries that we set up not only between our family and other people, but also between members of our families themselves. And so one example of an external boundary um, would be, for example, your last name. And so it's quite common, for example, that people will call a family group by, oh, here are the Rogers, or here are the Nguyen's, or here are the Rodriguez's. And so we'll have kind of families that identify themselves by their last name and that's a psychological boundary that's telling other people that I'm a Rodriguez and you're not right or I'm a Stevenson and you're not and so it kind of sets up who psychologically is part of the family and who is not um, and X an internal boundary within the family might be like I said, co uh, set up through communication um, by which family members get to interact with who. So, for example, if you are having a really hard time in school or having a really bad day at work, the person that you go to in your family for support 
usually indicates what type of open psychological boundary you have with that person. So let's say for this example, it is one of your siblings. You just feel like you can go to your sister and your brother and you can talk to them about any problems that you have. But maybe you don't feel the same about your cousins. Maybe you don't feel like you can go to your cousins and talk to them about your problems. And so that's an example of an internal psychological boundary. Your cousins are still part of your family. You still care about them, but there is this kind of psychological barrier where, okay, but you're not in that inner group where I would go to um, and call my most immediate family. And of course, it can vary. Maybe you're someone that's not very close to your siblings, but you're very close to your cousin. And so this is all um, of course, uh, has a, a lot of diversity and a lot of variety when it comes to all of our families because all families are different and all people are different. And the last piece of the definition is that families evolve um, through time. Um, families are one of the most unique groups of people that you can study in communication because not only do they have the same past, meaning that they all share some sort of lineage or connection to one another, um, but they typically also share the same present and future and that will always impact their communication. One example I can give you is this. If you compare and contrast a coworker at your job and someone in your family, the way you talk to them is not only different because of your relationship, but also because of your expectations of how long you're going to know this person. Um, you might not stay at that job forever, right? You might not have a shared future with this coworker. And so it might change the way you communicate with them. You might care about them less or you might not be as careful with your words because honestly, your emotional connection, your relational connection to them is not as strong because you're aware that I'm probably not going to always be with this person, hang out with this person, know this person. Um, but for example, with a family member, you have a very reasonable expectation that you're going to know them for the rest of your life, if not the rest of their life, or at least for a very long time. Um, and so what that tells us is, is that in families, communication is exponentially in, as important as it is in other settings, simply because we understand that families depend upon each other um, in the past and they have continued to depend upon each other in the present and will expect to depend upon each other in the future. And remember what I said earlier about how every past interaction you have with a family member will influence your current expectations. And so that also helps us understand the complexities of family communication. If someone in your family has hurt you in the past or has done things to upset you, that's going to affect the way you communicate with them in the present and affects your mindset about them, about what you can expect out of them in the future. That doesn't mean that people don't change, but ultimately what your expectations are as a communicator um, will always influence the interaction. All right? So moving on to um, a couple of pieces, one of the uh, important things that I want to remember is that communication is really what builds a family. Um, and this is why we have this course and this is why we have this body of study. And one of the three major things I want you to remember is that communication shapes family life, reflects family relations, and is absolutely important for a family to actually function properly. This is why we even have um, a, a people who are family therapists, for example, whose job it is to assist families in how to communicate with one another in a better way so that the family as a whole can function. And we've covered these three bullet points previously in our definition as well about how important it is um, uh, that communication is there to shape our family life um, and define our relationships with other people. Of course, this is a video that I've had you watch um, and discuss in a variety of ways of how important the way we phrase things, how we say things, and the type of communication we engage with others in. So please watch that video if you have not already um, and think critically about those questions. So since we've talking so much about how important communication is, why not go into the definition of communication and make sure we tease out understanding what communication really is. And like I said earlier in this lecture, just like with family, communication is definitely probably a word that you have heard extensively before, um, but now we're we're putting it into a more um, a social scientific research-based context so that we can understand it from theory, not just from 
uh, uh, our everyday conversations. So the first thing that I want you to know um, is that these are communication axioms. And right here I put the word axiom as a principle or a characteristic um, so you understand what the word axiom means if it's not a word familiar to you. Um, and so all of these are communication axioms and underneath these bullet points are the definitions of them. And so the first one I want you to, highl to highlight for you is that communication is a process, meaning that it is a constant back and forth between a sender and a receiver of a message where they're consistently influencing one another. Um, before, we used to have a linear model of communication where it was thought that one person talks and the other person listens, and then the other person talks and the other person listens, and then we thought it was a one-way street, but that's wrong. Um, what we know about communication now, theoretically, is that it is a dynamic, complex process that is always changing. Um, so, for example, um, when I lecture in my face-to-face -face courses, a lot of people might see that as, oh, the professor is talking and the students are listening, and it's a one-way interaction. And it's not that simple. Even though the students in the classroom are not talking, they're nodding or they're taking notes or they're giving me kind of confused looks. And all of these different nonverbal behaviors will indicate to me what I should do next in the interaction, ultimately influencing me in my behavior. So, for example, if I see a lot of students still taking notes, I'll make sure not to go off to the next slide. If I see a lot of students that are finished taking notes and nodding and looking at me, I know that they understand what we're talking about and I can move on to the next concept. If I see a lot of students who look a little worried or who have this kind of head tilt and look confused, I know I should probably slow down and re-explain that. And so in that moment, even though students aren't saying anything verbally, their nonverbal communication is continuously influencing me and, and impacting my behavior, my next steps, my next choices in the lecture. And so that's an example of how communication is this process, right? Anytime you have a, a conversation with someone, they are going to influence what you say next, what you say and what you do and how you behave nonverbally is going to impact how they behave um, next and so on and so forth. It's a very complex and continually changing process. Next up, communication involves a co-construction of definitions, meaning that um, people discuss meaning with one another, right? Um, not only meaning by, oh, what did you mean by that? sentence-wise, but we also share meanings of our words together. So as human beings, we have this incredible capability of language where we've been able to share meaning with one another and agree on a language and agree on symbols or words that all have shared meaning with one another. Communication also involves codes. Um, as a result of that sharing meaning. Um, verbal codes, of course, are words, the definition of words, um, and their literal definition in the dictionary, right? But then we also have um, nonverbal codes that don't have a dictionary, such as facial expressions, body movements. These are things that we read into. Um, so for example, if uh, you were in one of my face-to-face -face classes and I said, hi, Sally, I would really like to see you after class, and I said it in that really happy tone versus saying, hi, Sally, I would really like to see you after class. Um, that change of tone and the change in my nonverbal behavior really will influence the way the student reads into that message, right? And so that's an example of how nonverbal codes are very important in our everyday communication. Um, Next up, communication occurs in a context, meaning that you can't rip a communication interaction from the context in which it is born, right? Um, so, for example, we all understand the importance of context. We've all been a victim of someone who's maybe taken our words out of context, meaning that they've understood it without the way we meant it to be understood. Um, sharing of meaning is always a complex thing. Um, and when you take context into account, you have to take that into account with the verbal and nonverbal codes that the person is sending. So one example of that is if I were, for example, having a really bad day and I came home and I talked to my mom about it and I was crying and I was sharing with her how stressed I am about something, um, it would make sense for her in that context to comfort me and tell me everything is okay um, and to hold me or hug me. Um, and those nonverbal behaviors and those verbal behaviors are okay in that context because it makes sense sense, right? Um, but, for example, it wouldn't be appropriate for anyone to make a joke when someone's having a really bad day, right? Um, it may or may not be appropriate depending on the context. Um, maybe the joke is an inside joke and so that's okay um, and that might make the person laugh or be happy. Or maybe the person doesn't really want to hear a joke right now and they're having a 
a, a very stressful day. And so in context, that joke doesn't make sense or it's not as funny. So context is the external kind of environment that our communication goes into that obviously in, that always will influence the way the other person interprets our message. Okay. Communication is a transaction. Um, like I said before, um, it's linked to how it's a process. It's a simultaneous um, sending and receiving, sending and receiving, right? Um, when I'm listening to someone, I'm still sending off messages that I'm listening. Um, I'm still nodding and smiling and giving them eye contact. And lastly, um, and this is very important for our studies, communication um, takes place on two levels, both the relational level and the content level. So the content is the verbal, the actual direct message that you're sending off. The relational level includes messages regarding the relationship of the person. In a family communication setting, you have all practiced this. So one example might be um, you are a young child and you need money to go on a field trip. Um, and so usually you would go to your parents and say, hi parents, I really need $10 to go on this field trip. What you're really telling them on a content level is, I, you know, I need money, but on a relational level, that example illustrates that you as the child understand that they are the ones that have power in that situation. They hold the money and your parents are an authority figure over you. So it, that meant that the statement of I need $10 parents in order to go on this field trip has both a content dimension, meaning that the content is I need the $10, but the relational dimension illustrates that you guys have the power. The reason I'm even coming to you and telling you this is me recognizing that you have authority over me because I'm your child. Of course, as children, um, we're not actively thinking of that, but that's one example that we often see in family communication that illustrates how um, there's both this content and relational level to communication. Next up, culture, um, and we will cover culture more extensively in different chapters. Um, for the purposes of this chapter, we're just going to define it so that we understand it um, and can move forward with this definition. Um, but culture is the historical shared system of symbolic resources, meaning that um, you can't have a culture by yourself it has to be shared with other people. Um, and so there's four major levels in the textbook, relational, popular, main culture, and co-culture. Um, so popular and co-cultures are part of this external part of your family. They're not created by your family, but they do influence your family. So for example, it might be anything in the mainstream media. It might be external society as a whole that impacts your family and the way that you all behave. Um, these examples of these are like governmental policies, social movements, really popular movies, economic conditions. Um, these are things that will impact the ways families interact with one another. Um, and this, of course, is really important to recognize, as we talked about with boundaries earlier. Um, there are both external and internal boundaries. And so um, as family members, um, you may or may not have set up external boundaries in order to counteract some of these experiences. Um, ultimately, now, uh, one of the cool things that your textbook does is it tells us some interesting trends that we see in families now. Um, and I'll, I've put them here um, in a shorter way, distilled them so that they're a little bit easier to get through. Um, but it's really awesome to look at the data that the textbook gives you. Um, and we see that, of course, marriage rates are declining. People are marrying at a far lower rate um, and staying married at a far lower rate than we've seen in the past. Um, of course, that means divorce rates are rising. We see single parenting increasing, step families increasing, child poverty increasing, and people are living longer. Um, and ultimately, what that gets us to is the complexity between families of origin and intergenerationality. That's a lot of syllables to say. And so your family of origin is the family in which you are raised, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the people that continue to be your family when you're an adult, right? Um, and so we call them families of origin because their influence passes into how you raise your family. Um, and so that is a concept we call intergenerationality. So it's the legacy that is passed down from your family of origin onto you that you pass down onto your family, should you choose to have one when you have one. <clears throat> 
And so, <clears throat> excuse me, now we move on to family configurations. And um, there is an extensive list, and I'm going to go through them, um, and they're pretty straightforward in the textbook as well. And I put a little video for you to see not only an example of intergenerationality, but also how um, in uh, this clip from Modern Family, um, they all get together, but there's different types of families all melding together to become one big family. So they're all each other's extended family, um, but they are definitely challenging challenging this idea of the nuclear family. So the nuclear family is um, what you typically will see in um, Disney movies, um, what is kind of the standard mainstream way of thinking of a family. Usually um, a heterosexual couple, male, female, they have children. Um, <clears throat> And we see uh, the father usually as being the primary breadwinner. Um, sometimes we'll see the mother as the kind of full-time full um, housewife, homemaker, stay-at-home mom. Um, and that's kind of that model of the nuclear family. Um, and it's it's been a staple of American culture for a very long time. Um, however, it is declining due to those external cultural variables that we just talked about. Um, economic policies have made it so that um, it's usually not viable or logical for women to stay home anymore um, because most of the time now to raise children you need a dual income household. You need two incomes coming in. So the nuclear family has definitely molded and changed over time. Well, of course now we also have the gay and lesbian family which is a family um, right where they have children and um, the parents are same sex and they serve the parents as one child. Um, and then we also have extended family. All of us, generally speaking, have an extended family. Um, things like your uncles and your aunts, your grandmas, your grandpas, all of the people that are not immediately um, uh, within your family. These are the people that you would see, for example, on Thanksgiving or holidays or New Year's or whatever. Um, and these are the people that you would interact with outside of your immediate family and would call your family. Um, step family is another family configuration or type. Um, this is when families uh, marry uh, uh, into each other because two people have met and so you may or may not have a stepbrother or stepsister um, as a result of one of your parents marrying uh, someone else that is not biologically um, your mother or father or was not part of your family of origin. We also have single parent families, and uh, as the research has shown us, this is increasing now. Um, but these are single parent households where we see that one parent is the primary provider for all of the children involved. Um, and then we also have couples, and these are family systems that do not involve children. Um, and these are couples that are typically married or have extended um, commitment to one another. So they've moved in together, right? They're living together, um, and they... Uh, typically either choose to marry because of the legal rights and privileges that come along with it, but ultimately these are couples that live together long term without children. Um, and that leads us lastly into Fitzpatrick's model of marital types. So what this tells us is that um, a very a lovely researcher by the name of Marianne Fitzpatrick back in uh, the 1980s, um, decided to kind of un try to understand different types of families um, based off their communication practices. So what she did was she tried to analyze how do people think about their marriage relationship? How do people um, describe their marriage? And how does that help me as a rese researcher predict the type of relationship that they have? And so what she did was she measured people's conventionality, interdependence, and communication. Um, and then what she did was she created a survey based off of those results. And so let's go over these different factors that she asked first, and then we'll go over um, the different types of marriages you can have. So conventionality refers to um, how traditional someone is. So for example, whether or not a woman takes her husband's last name, um, whether or not the woman or male subscribes to those normal um, normalized gender norms. <clears throat> such as the women staying home, the male working, those kind of stereotypical gender norms and traditions. Um, <clears throat> so it measures that level of conventionality, so how traditional are you or not traditional are you. Interdependence measures how much both physical and psychological space each partner feels is appropriate. So some partners are very tight-knit, close together. They like to spend a lot of their free time together, if not all their free time together, both physically together and psychologically sharing a lot of um, their emotions and feelings with one another 
with one another. And we might have couples that are the opposite, who are very um, less interdependent. Maybe when they do have time off from work or free time, they would prefer to spend it with fam other family members or friends. Um, and then they spend a little bit less time with one another. Maybe they don't share as much with one another. Um, they're not as emotionally intimate where they would share a lot of their feelings and stresses and ideas with one another. Um, and so for those types of couples, there's more physical and psychological space. She also measured, lastly, communication, whether or not people believed conflict was important or should be avoided. And so um, she took these three um, ideologies of ways of looking at marriage. So for example, if I was Marianne Fitzpatrick, I would ask you, um, would you prefer, for example, on a day off to hang out with your significant other or go out um, and hang out with your friends you haven't seen in a while? Um, and so depending on what response you give me, I am able to identify where you're at in your level of inter interdependence, how important it is um, that you see um, being interdependent and connected with your um, marital partner. So after asking people these questions, she came up with a model of marital types um, that uh, actually I would like to show you where it is in the textbook so you know where I'm at because I believe the um, the chart is so useful and so helpful for understanding it. It's always a quick looky-loo. So it's actually right here on page 45, and it's this beautiful um, little chart that kind of helps us summarize this um, idea of model of uh, uh, her, her model. Um, and so what we get um, from her model are traditional couples, independent couples, and separate couples. And you can see that this actually pairs very well with my previous slide where she asked about conventionality, interdependence, and communication. Um, and so traditional couples are couples that um, are all about stability. Um, they want to uh, always tackle conflict, um, and they have a lot of interdependence with one another. So um, they are people that um, love to be very traditional. Again, like we said here, they love to have high levels of interdependence and they love to communicate a lot. Um, again, this references back to what she was asking people here, okay? Next up, she got uh, another category called independent couples. And these are couples that um, really like a little bit more space. Uh, so, um, and they're not as... Um, uh, physically and psychologically close, um, but as traditional couples, but they still really think communication is super important. And so they also don't want to avoid conflict. And they also want to share a lot um, of their feelings and their thoughts with one another. So even though there's an emphasis on individual freedom um, compared to traditional couples, they still are very interconnected. And lastly, we have separate couples who are the most as their name says, the most separated. They love individual freedom and they prioritize it over anything else. And so as a result, they tend to have a lot of physical and psychological distance and they also tend to always avoid conflicts, meaning they don't talk about conflicts when they do arise. Um, and so the way you would look at this is um, traditional couples are um, and separate couples are the extremes and independent couples are kind of that that middle ground where we would see that. And for many of you, if you are married or if your parents are married, it's really cool to kind of look and see what type that you or your parents fall into. Um, it's always interesting also to see um, if your partner or the spouse would agree of what type of couple you are, because there sometimes is um, a differential, as your textbook says, um, sometimes uh, uh, Fitzpatrick couldn't put a couple in a category because the two spouses would not agree on what type of couple they were. And so 40%, I believe, is the number um, of people she put into the mixed category. They're kind of mixed. And that's always an interesting thing to think about, right? That you would assume that people would perceive their relationship in the same way. Um, but Fitzpatrick's model tells us that we don't. And so um, on top of Fitzpatrick's model, um, we also have Cantor and Lear's family types, um, which it, unlike uh, Fitzpatrick, who measured people's interdependence, um, their communication, and how conventional they were, Cantor and Lear um, uh, focus more on power, meaning, and affect. Affect meaning um, closeness and caring, not affect like the verb to affect something, but affect. Um, and so what they came up with were closed, open, and random families. Um, and so closed families um, are very uh, 
uh, focused. They're very, um, uh, they have kind of the same routine every day. Um, they use fixed space and they're very on time. Um, they like to stay consistent. Open families um, are more uh, open to uh, uh, changing their family identity over time. Um, they're usually more okay with changing traditional roles or getting rid of traditional roles all entirely. And then random families um, are all about what makes sense affectively, emotionally in the moment. And so that's why you'll see that random families literally seem to be functioning randomly, but it's really because they want to focus on what makes most sense for them in that moment. Um, and so we'll go into deeper examples of closed, open, and random families in later chapters, but this is a great kind of first overview. And I really recommend, again, that you dive into the examples, not only provided by, by me, but also um, by your chapter, because uh, they do a great job of it. So that was chapter one. Um, I know it's a lot of information, but we're sweeping through some really important definitions that um, are very key to us and understanding and moving forward into chapter two and three. Chapter two is all about theory. And so it's even more important that we understand these terms because we can't understand family communication theory until we have the proper definitions to do so. So I hope this lecture was helpful for you as a quick overview of chapter one. As always, I'm available to answer questions and give you more examples. Um, I've given a lot of examples here, but every student is different. And so if you find that these examples aren't helpful or that you need different kinds of examples to understand this, always shoot me a message on Canvas or email or set up an appointment with me and we can do a phone call or video chat and I can go through with some of the stuff that you may need help with or more clarification with. Have a great day everybody!